So to introduce our speakers, I'm going to whiz through because we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, at the very end, we have Hannah Starkey, um, hey, well, artist, photographer, and current, he, currently ex exhibiting at the Hayward Gallery. Um, then we have blogger, journalist, activist, Feminista Jones. Then we have Leila Hussein, um, psychotherapist and co-founder of the anti-FGM movement, Daughters of Eve. Um, then we have Kate Smurthwaite, comedian and activist. And then we have Francesca Steele, uh, live artist and former bodybuilder. Yeah. And former bodybuilder. Um, so first of all, I'm going to just ask the speakers to say yes. Thank you. <laughs> so first of all, I'm going to ask the speakers just to say a, uh, a few words, just to put themselves in context um, about their work, their work and their views on the whole notion of how society owns women's bodies. Hannah, I'm going to start with you. Okay, hello. Um, I am a photographer, but I'm a sort of an everything photographer in that I've had the amazing luck to be able to work in all the different categories within photography. So from fine art, to fashion, to advertising, to uh, photojournalism. And what, what I, my relationship with photography is it's a, a visual language that we're all very much familiar with. And we're shaped by, particularly women, we are shaped by photography. Um, and it's really important for us to take that control back and to take the visual intelligence and the image back. And I think I can say this because I you know, have such a cross-the-board experience of, in photography, but I also have two teenage daughters. And I've also watched our visual culture and how it represents women from you know, a young woman myself to my teenage daughters and also a 43-year-old woman now. And I am disgusted at how little they are given, that how, how the, the images that they're being shown in advertising now is so cynical, it's profit-driven, it's very dangerous because it's influenced by the language of porn. And this is influencing our daughters and our sons from about the age of 11. So I have lots of ideas about how we can change that. But I will Great. move on now. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Feminista Jones. Um, if you want context, I am a black woman living in one of the most racist, sexist nations on the planet. That's the context. I write about that stuff, and I fight against it. Great. Thank you very much. Leila. Um, I, well, t I mean, as, my, uh, as a psychotherapist, and, and I work specifically with women who have experienced violence, sexual violence, specifically um, female genital mutilation, and for me, part of my work is actually to help the women reconnect with the part of their body that they've lost. Because the moment they were cut as children, that was the moment their bodies were owned by a patriarchal system. So for me, part of my work is to get them from that journey to a point where they can finally reclaim their bodies again. So that's the great. Thank speaking. you very much. Kate. Uh, yeah, so hi. So I, uh, yeah, as, uh, as Hannah said, I'm a comedian and an activist, and I'm, I'm quite involved in quite a lot of different areas of feminism. But really the hat that I'm wearing today um, is my, I work with uh, Abortion Rights UK, um, and I'm their vice chair and media spokesperson. Um, and so we're looking at um, defending and extending uh, women's right to make uh, those very, very important uh, choices about her own body. Thank you very much. Francesca. Is it okay if I... Yes, so Francesca um, is going to tell us um, in a bit more depth about some of the work that you were doing. I'm just going to, you know, show just some if images. You, yep, do, do you want to go to the... Is it okay to start at slide Great. three? Um, so I'm a PhD student at Northumbria University um, and um, I'm going to talk about my bodybuilding work. I've always used my body and presence in my own work, either as a kind of like a life model or more as a dynamic um, in a relationship between the audience and performer. But I just wanted to read a little recent reflection that I wrote about my experience bodybuilding because I've kind of come out the other side now. Um, sorry, full. Um, one of the many things people don't realise about competitive bodybuilding is, it that, is that it makes you feel exposed. Exposed in a way that discomfort cannot describe. It feels like you reveal your structure, your core, your DNA. It feels like you show the mechanism within your body that holds it up. You show your skeleton. 
not only in, a in physical structure, but mental too. It is an extreme sport. It is an extreme lifestyle. It carries many sacrifices. It is also choice. Through the beginning to the end of my experience, everything changed. I became lost. At points, I no longer knew who or what I was or what I was trying to achieve, trapped between, trapped between different everyday worlds which were motherhood, bodybuilding, and my constantly transforming body art were the currencies of my flesh. There was a gender conflict, an identity crisis. My body had become a paradox across genders. Whilst competing, I was judged on both my feminine and male traits. My body was, com um, my body was compared what was my body compared to what it is now? I began to defy, defy binary opposition. My body began to take up the space of not fully feminine or masculine. I was in between. I transgressed my natural state. I began to infringe on my gender. I became a contradiction. Um, now I realize I tried to satisfy a need for equality through the masculine and masculinization of my aesthetic and mental form. And at competition time, it felt this equality was reached. In terms of artistic practice, I started the project to examine gender, to shake up my work, for my body to speak for itself, to have a material, palpable, living, breathing artwork, which was me. Personally, my marriage was breaking down. I had been in some traumatic situation, and there was a situations and there was a felt lack of control in my life followed by a, an attempt to grasp at it bodybuilding gave me a way back into a contrasting anatomy of artistic practice back to presence and structure back to strict discipline a discipline of training diet and drug use some of the things i already knew but was blindly aware when i started I said before I'm naive, but maybe we're drawn to the things we instinctively know. I have spent much of my life trying to control or own my body in one way or another. I'm still unsure, and I think back to therapeutic conversations. Is it a visceral self-ownership or trying to know myself deeper, push myself or own myself, an attempt at finding my place? My place is that of transformation, that of good and bad. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesca. Um, Hannah, actually, th th there seem to be quite a few, um, I mean, with, with, with all of you, but you're also an artist, and, and you also focus very much on um, the female bodies as a sort of placement in art, but also within cities. And mm -hmm. do you want to just, I mean, d d when you're listening to Francesca speak, does that, what does that make you think about? Um, well, I suppose in my, in my work, um, which is considered my artwork, I only photograph women actually, because I'm trying to create a space that offers women another, a different, uh, an alternative view of what it means to be female in a visual language. Um, so, and I, I've been doing that, you know, since I left college, so quite a long time, 15 years now. And um, I, know, I know exactly what you, you're saying, and I, know, I also know why that has come about, it's because we are very... We're, very, we're highly visually intelligent. It's how we absorb information in the world. And you know, these, th this, these messages that we've been given are subliminal, and they do um, feed in, as we can see, by how our society um, has very narrow I ideas of gender, and that's perpetuated by advertising, and it's destructive to the individual. So yeah, I think we all go on a journey to try and work out. And I just, I think visually that it, it's really influential. Mm -hmm. Leila, um, again, when, when I hear Francesca speak or when I, when I hear people talking about um, how women's bodies are supposed to look and the things we are supposed to do to our bodies to make them look a certain way, that conversation is almost exactly the same as the FGM conversation. Absolutely. Um, for me, it's... Um, I mean, and, and if you actually bring the conversation about design of vagina in this mm. country, you know, the parallel between FGM and that particular practice, you know, I think sometimes because of someone's shade or different background, 
for some reason, FGM has become this barbaric practice, but actually, if we go to Harley Street in London, they're practicing FGM type 1 and type 2. But the argument has always been, oh, these women have a choice. Actually, where, when is it a choice when we have a society that tells women their vaginas need to look a certain way? So for me, again, it comes back to the idea of both communities are telling these young girls, actually, you will not be accepted by men unless your vagina looks a certain way. So when we talk about it, we need to talk about it in a, you know, from a universal perspective. So mm -hmm. absolutely, it, again, for me, what you, just seeing that, what it brought up for me was this idea of control. Our bodies are being controlled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Feminista Jones, is your body being controlled? By me, yes. <laughs> um, but you know, I can't, like I said, you know, I come from a place that has a legacy of centuries of um, reducing black women's bodies simply to produce a free, more free labor. Um, America's you know, labor source, our entire economy was designed and based on the idea of having free labor, and black women were responsible for producing more of that labor. Um, and, and, and historically, that's pretty much how people have come to see us. So everything that we do, everywhere that we go, it is that people expect us to use our bodies for their labor, to do their work. I mean, it even translates on Twitter today, you know, um, people constantly tweeting me and telling me that I need to share something or that if I really care about women, I should be sharing these things. And I'm like, have you ever heard of the phrase, good morning? Hello, <laughs> how are you? See, but when you don't see somebody as a human being, you don't respect their body, their time, their space, their energy, or anything. So you make demands and you expect labor. And so for black women walking around navigating you know, our society um, in, in the United States, we are seen as, okay, what's the next thing you're going to do for me? And um, in, in her opening, um, po the second poem that she spoke, uh, Bridget spoke very much about the, the um, UO cases. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do anti-street harassment work um, in the United States, and, and I've been reaching women around the world, uh, primarily because a lot of the work has featured white women as the victims and men of color as the predators and perpetrators, and we know that that is not the case. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to center black women's experiences because I believe that black women generally and on the whole experience street harassment way harsher, way more frequently, and in ways that are more likely to lead to death. Um, within the last nine months or so, four black women in the United States were killed because they rejected men. I mean, well, three were killed and one had her throat slashed. Um, simply because they ignored a man or rejected them. We didn't hear stories of that happening to white women. We heard, we saw Huffington Post with people with signs saying, hey baby, and things like that. And of course that's, you know, that sucks. But for us it's, hey bitch, if you don't talk to me, I might kill you. So I wanted to talk about that and let, allow w black women to speak up because we were feeling silenced because everything was about, oh, these black men, these Latino men are preying on white women. And we feel loyal to our brothers who are facing racism and police brutality, so we often don't speak up when these things happen to us. Uh, when women uh, report uh, sexual assault at a rate of 24%, they say, in America, it's actually 17% for black women, because we're afraid to speak up. One, we don't believe anybody's gonna care. We know nobody's gonna care. Two, we don't think that we'll be believed. And three, we'll be labored as race traitors, which is something that I am called every day. Actually, this morning, <laughs> um, somebody said that I need to be shot, so, for this work, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Um, Kate, some of the um, some of the work that you're doing um, is is also on how some of the gains that we've got actually in terms of ownership of our bodies, whether that's reproductive rights or abortion rights, are actually under threat. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Um, well, yeah, I think I think <coughs> I'll do this. Um, so um, I think I think one of the problems that we're constantly fighting against is that is that power exists and power is there. It's a thing that's out there, and we identify it and we come up with a great plan for dealing with it. Um, but what, what very often happens in the longer term is that, is that because the power is still there, whatever brilliant strategy we come up with kind of ends up getting turned around and used against us, as it were. So um, to give you an example, um, you know, I remember um, you know, my, my, my mother's generation talking about se the sexual revolution and sexual liberation, and suddenly I'm told I must want pole dancing lessons. And I'm going, hold on, no, that wasn't what we meant the first time around. And, and, and then we had this wonderful idea that women needed to be empowered, and that's a fabulous idea. And you know the last thing that said it was going to empower me? Well, it was my petrochemical shampoo, um, because these days shampoo is empowering. And, uh, which is so weird, you never hear anybody say, so Mrs. Clinton, being Secretary of State, must be pretty empowering, because when there is real power there, we don't, we don't need that. So it's, it's really difficult that I think we have these great ideas, and, and then all too often, because we still don't have the power, 
Uh, I don't know if you know, but some of the laws which have been brought in by the EU uh, to challenge sexism, uh, laws allowing people to, you know, to make a fuss if they're a victim of sexism, have actually been used more by men than by women. And like, first of all, like, I'm all for it. If men are being discriminated against, of course, you know, that the law is supposed to protect everybody. Um, but that's obviously not the idea of, of, of the law coming in in the first place. The idea was always that it would support women. So that, of course, that's not to say that the solution is to throw these ideas out, because they were good ideas that identified a real problem and challenged it. Um, but the important thing is to remember that these ways of dealing with problems are models. And when they're working for us, great, use them. Um, but don't feel like we have to keep modelling fluid dynamics with quantum laws, um, she says, to pull in a ludicrous physics uh, analogy. Um, but, yeah. And then, um, I mean, Feminista Jones just told, uh, just told us that she's regularly threatened, and just today has been threatened. Um, so people are now, or men largely, are finding new ways in which to control us. Um, is this something you're experiencing? Yeah, I, I, I get rape and death threats most weeks. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that, which I realise some people look shocked and I realise, yeah, that is, that's the world I live in. And um, I get asked a lot to go into schools and uh, give talks to young women and encourage them to speak out more. And I, I just want to say no. Like, I think young women who don't speak out, they know what will happen if they do and they're making a choice. And I, I think if we want young women to speak out, we need to make sure that when they do they're not attacked for doing so. And I think when we do that, they will speak out. Um, and, and also you, Leila, when you've spoken out, certainly at the beginning when you, was, when you started to speak out, um, what kind of response were you getting? Oh, God. And social media is another form of attacking people. I mean, my experience, I was one of the first um, survivors that spoke out against FGM, so I felt quite isolated at the time. Which led to, you know, I had to move home a couple of times. Uh, my address is protected. I have a panic alarm. I have a personal alarm that I have to carry. I have to let people know where I am at all times. And I mean, my daughter's actually in the room today, so she kind of is part. And, and you know, it affects your whole family when you get in this kind of role. Um, you know, I have to speak to her school about a couple of things and safety. So it's become part of our lives. I mean, it affects. My mother, at one point, she couldn't go to a local mosque because every time she walked in, there'd be whispers mm -hmm. and... But, you know, things are changing. And mm -hmm. I think it's because a lot of us, I think, on this panel refuse not to speak out. We are speaking out. Mm -hmm. And I think, for me, when you stay silent, you are consenting, especially mm -hmm. if you can see there's a big issue, especially mm -hmm. discriminating against women and girls. Because at the end of the day, I think a lot of us uh, have ended up in this situation because we were born as girls and that's what we were guilty of. Mm -hmm. And I think to be criminalised and vilified for that is absolutely something I won't tolerate. And many people say to me, you know, why would you take that from anybody? For me, that, that, those threats override when I get an email from a woman who would say to me, Leila, because of you speaking out meant I didn't cut my daughter and, he, and I, took, I got some help. Mm -hmm. That overrides any type of threat. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, I, just, I just wanted to add, because I've, I've gotten into conversations about what silence means, and you just said that you know, if you're silent, you're consenting, and, and I have to respectfully disagree, because for many people, silence is survival, and a lot of times, you know, we take this on, and we've made this choice to do this, and so we prepare ourselves mentally and spiritually and emotionally to kind of go out and to do this work, so we are prepared for what's gonna happen. A lot of people have not had the opportunity to do that, nor do they, nor are they capable of doing it. I, I, I work with a number of people who, for various, you know, disabilities or things like that, are unable to withstand what we deal with, you know what I'm saying? And I always think when people say, oh, you're so strong or whatever, I'm like, eh, maybe I'm not. But I also try not to criticize those who remain silent because I understand that for certain folks, particularly in certain situations and things like that, silence may be the only thing that gets them to waking up the next day. And maybe they, you know, maybe one day, maybe next month, maybe next year, they'll be able to say something. But I think about women that have been sexually assaulted and how that same thing, you didn't say no, so that must mean you consented. Like this, the idea that silence equals consent is something that we are legally battling now in the United States, like state by state. So it's a little bit of a tricky thing, and I'm not, I agree with everything that you're saying, and I do believe that we have to work more and, and try to encourage people to speak up and, as you said, protect people. But at the same time, there is a culture that believes, well, if you're silent, you do consent, and you must want it. So it can work on that other side. No, that's yeah, I'm sure that's, that's, that's not what I was saying. 
I think when I said, you know, being, you know, by being silent, you're consenting, I'm talking about politicians, for example, you know, community leaders. People who have power people already. People who have power yeah. already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I do understand. Yeah. I, yeah. I know why yeah. I spoke out, but my sister never spoke yeah. out. Right. That doesn't yeah. mean she's yeah. powerless. Yeah. But I mean those who are in positions to make the change. Okay. And I'm also talking about, you know, campaigners. Mm -hmm. I've noticed some campaigners, mm -hmm. they treat human rights issue as a a buffet in a pizza mm. hut mm. because they think, oh, this suits me. No, I'm not going to talk about this. So I'm mm. going to talk. Right to right. me, when you are saying as a campaigner, you have a platform to speak out, when you speak out any form of discussion, when you talk about so any campaigns, you yeah. need to talk about everything. Does it worry you then? Because, um, because campaigns do go almost in and out of fashion, actually. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. five years ago, nobody <laughs> was talking about FGM. And now everybody is talking about, well, a lot of people are talking about, not everybody, a lot of people are. Um, does it worry you that the kind of the campaigning caravan is going to move somewhere else next week? I think a lot of us who have been here for, you know, 12, 30 mm. years, we kind of know because we've seen it happen yeah. a couple of times. And we always have a joke, you know, oh, once this calms down, we're going to have to go back and do that hard work yeah. again. Right. So it's, I'm hoping it, that's not the case this mm -hmm. time around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So Hannah? Yeah. Um, I, I think it is getting out. I think the voice is definitely mm -hmm. getting out. And it's my 14-year-old daughter had a 15-minute lesson on FGM at, at school and uh, was able to come home and educate me. Mm. And it really has a knock-on effect and it empowers girls to work collectively together, even in that grassroots mm. level. So right. yes. it is amazing what you're doing and it's, it's traveling, mm -hmm. in my opinion, through schools and education. Kate. Um, yeah, well, I just wanted to say something about the idea of speaking out because, um, you know, I, of course, there are times when you can't and, and there are times when it's too scary and there are times when there's a backlash and we need to deal with that sort of thing. Um, but, but I have to say, first of all, that, um, that people like Layla who've spoken out and Layla being one of the first people I ever encountered who'd mm. overtly spoken out about her own experience um, was one of the things that really woke me up to understanding what FGM was and who it affected and all of this kind of stuff. And right now um, in the UK, um, abortion rights are very much under threat. Um, if you look at the US, abortion is legal, but in practice, you pretty much can't get one unless you are really very fortunate indeed and live in the right area or have the money to travel and seek out the services you want because they're under this constant barrage of attack from a minority um, who oppose them. And, and as the media spokesperson for abortion rights, the question I'm constantly asked is how on earth are we going to stop that kind of war being waged in this country and being successful because we've already seen clinic protests, legal challenges, doctors feeling that they're being supervised, all these kind of chipping away at our basic rights. And, um, and, and I'm forced to look to other campaigns that are having a success or have had successes. And there are some really obvious ones here, like the gay rights movement has been so successful over the last few decades, not that it's finished, not that there isn't a great deal more to do, and there are parts of the world where there's a lot, lot more to do, um, but it's been really successful, and seeing FGM come into the news, I think this is amazing, this is fantastic. Um, and both of those have happened when people came out and stood up and said, I've had this experience. And one in three women in Britain has had an abortion, and I think that the most powerful thing we could possibly do um, to stop this campaign that has been so successful in the US becoming the, the way forward with abortion becoming more and more inaccessible in Britain, the most powerful thing we could do is if the one in three women who, like me, have had an abortion just started saying so. And I think it would ruin a few dinner parties, but it might also <laughs> or not. change the world. Or not. Um. Okay, I'm going to open the floor out now for questions. We have a lot of people in the room, so, so please, <laughs> so please wait for the mic. Where where are the mics? Great. If you could wait for the mics to reach you, that would be great. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and we will do our best to come to you. A lot of shy people in the room. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. First of all, thank you very much for all the things you said. It was really interesting. Um, some of you have said you've been doing this for a long time, and I just wanted to know your opinion. Do you think there's more backlash now against women's um, rights? Or not necessarily that, or the things that concern women now than there was, say, 10, 20 years ago? So is there more backlash, or is it just louder because of social media? 
Well, I, I, I'll, I'll give you my sort of 30 seconds worth. Um, I think there's always been a backlash against women's rights. I think there's always been a pushback. I think that what we're seeing in the 21st century is that, is that politics has kind of got... I won't say cleverer, because that's not really the word, but it's gotten sort of more Machiavellian and more twisted. And once upon a time, people who opposed women's rights kind of went, no, I am against this. Get back in the kitchen. And that was, you know, that was the anti-movement. Whereas these days, it's a lot more kind of subtle. I find people sort of going, well, you know, but other feminists are wrong. And well, I agree with some feminists. That sort of attempt to divide our movement by kind of driving, uh, you know, rifts between us by suggesting that women from different backgrounds aren't part of the same movement, that somehow we should all be against each other. I think that these days, the backlash against women's rights and against improving women's control over their lives is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit more twisted. Like a lot of people, uh, there's a sort of, sense that people who are actually against um, women's autonomy end up saying, no, 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 I'm for it. I just think we should express it in a different way. There's, I, I, sort of, I have this vision uh, that there's a somewhere in some dis distant uh, sort of undiscovered cave somewhere, there's a cave painting uh, of a woman going, no, I like being dragged around the hair, by the hair. It makes me feel more feminine. Um, and th I think that we're, what we're getting now is a more insidious kind of backlash that doesn't openly say, this is a backlash, I'm against what's going on, that says, no, no, I'm here to help you, but I'm here to help you mystically by taking half your rights away, which doesn't seem like helping, actually. Backlash. Yeah, I think that um, opposition to any group's rights really relies on how the economy is doing, at least in the United States or um, at least with the progress that that group is making. And what we, the, the situation we have right now in the United States is that um, nine million women, more women have gotten college degrees in the last 25 years than men. Women are now um, heads of household, financial heads of household in 40% of our homes. Women are getting married later and having children later. And there are a lot of old white men who are terrified that they're going to lose their incubators for their progeny. <laughs> so that is why we are now seeing an assault on abortion rights that we've not seen before since it's been legal. Um, we're seeing the, the tuition prices rising, I mean, ridiculously. We're seeing um, the wage inequity battle is just, it's out of control. All of these things is because there are some scared white men who are terrified that young white women are not going to reproduce more white men. And that's really what it comes down to. And the rest of us happen to deal with the effects of that, right? Because if black women are having abortions, who's going to be the labor force? Who are they going to be able to imprison to get the free labor out of the prisons that they pay for? Um, who is going to work in the fast food place? Like, this is how it is. If a Latino women don't produce, who's going, to pay, who's going to do the illegal work that they pay for, right? Like, this is how, this is how our country functions. And so that's why they're curving. They're trying to curb abortion rights because they need people to keep reproducing. Um, they don't want us voting as much, so there's voter suppression for women, and particularly if people of color, they don't want us running. So when a woman runs, they drag her through the mud. If you've seen what happened with Wendy Davis, I mean, they tried to make that woman look like the devil simply because she wanted to run for governor. I mean, that is, that's what we're facing. I don't think it's any, I don't think it's actually worse I just think that it's just more like frantic and urgent because they're dying. <laughs> so when they're getting into this old age, they're like, wait a minute, what's happening here? So. Thank you. Next question. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, two parts. First part is, could you speak a little bit more around the topic, your topic of who owns bodies. our bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, I had not heard the term designer vaginas before. I'd like to know more about that. Uh, I also wanted to ask, what has happened to pubic hair? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one is for the woman on the end, you're Hannah as well. You said in the beginning that you had some strategies to combat, I forget what it was, either street harassment or something. I'd love to hear well, that. To protect but, our girls and our, and our boys. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, okay. okay, so I mean, pubic hair, I guess it's simply porn. That's porn what happened, happened to it, I, yeah. would, I would say. Porn Anybody else? Well, also, yeah. And also, the obsession with youth. So mm. when women don't have hair in their pubic regions, they look more like little girls. And unfortunately, those who consume sex, they are very interested in being the first to have a woman or have sex with somebody. Mm. So if she doesn't mm. have pubic hair, she's more, she looks more like a little girl. Like a child. So that's, it's between the child, in my opinion, between the child thing and the porn industry. The reason I want you to say more about mm. it than just yeah. one word course, is yeah. because I remember pubic hair. Mm. I, you know, I had it for years. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but my, you know, young women my daughter's age who start waxing, mm -hmm. I remember looking up and there were, they, it was gone. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's because they see it everywhere and they're encouraged to do it and they don't know where it started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the guys are saying, well, I won't have sex with you if That's you have true. pubic hair. That's which, true. when I turn it back on them, I'm like, mm. so do you like you? it looking like... A Not child. Like this? Well, a friend of mine, actually, a friend of mine who's based in New York, went to have a a light wax, <laughs> and and came back, and so she said, said, and she's British, and she, but she was in, in New York. And um, and she kind of was saying to them, not just just tidy up, don't take too much. Which is another conversation. But anyway, please just tidy up, don't take too much off. The woman ignored her, took everything off, and at the end of it said, "There you go, smooth as a baby." Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it is. That's how it is. Yeah. And that, and men will yeah. say, "I want it smooth as a baby," yeah. and I say, "You enjoy." Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but but this goes back to you know what this conversation's been about again. There's a system out there that actually is telling us how we need to look like, which mm -hmm. for me, when, I, when I'm campaigning against FGM, I'm also bringing in the parallel with designer vagina, because designer vagina is becoming, it's a big... Can you just explain what designer vagina is? So are. it started in America from what I understand, now it's in the UK, so it's ex basically women are having their labias trimmed because the boyfriend said it looks like a ham. This is one one of the women told me. Yeah, they. Yeah, again, goes back to the point. So it's basically reconstructing the vagina. And actually, it's, uh, it's very common amongst women who are divorced. Mm -hmm. Very common amongst because they feel for them to, if they're going to find a new partner, their vaginas need to be a bit tighter so they can feel like virgins. Yeah. And this is where yeah. the parallel comes in. <laughs> FGM is exactly the same thing. Your vagina is closed. It's tighter. You know, the labias are trimmed because, again it's smoother, so men apparently enjoy this. So again, it's th that's why I brought the two parallel skips. Mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't vilify one group and say they're barbaric and mm -hmm. not question the other one because the other one might be a blonde, blue-eyed girl. Mm -hmm. So we need, when we talk about this, we, talk, we have to talk about it in a universal context. And that context yeah. is, is gender violence. Absolutely, and that context and control. Is, mm -hmm. and, control. Mm -hmm. and, this is, and, and for me, you know, it's the, we need to really challenge the patriarchal system that we live under until we challenge that. And this comes back to the pubic hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, it's that system that tells us, oh, actually, I need you to look like a baby now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... I mean, if you really look into it, it's quite disturbing and seedy. And, yeah. and it's Francesca, sequence. when you were in the, in the bodybuilding scene, mm -hmm. um, yeah. that's extreme. Yeah. Yeah, when you have to have um, all your pubic hair taken off because you wear tiny little bikinis and do a dance on stage. But I think the thing about, um, you know, I think the thing about having pubic hair or having your pubic hair however you want really is choice. You know, I, I do... I do think, as mm. women, we have the choice. I don't think that it is just um, men want it like this, so we have to do it. You know, I think it's a whole... I think men are very pressured by porn, you know... They're not pressured a, to take off their pubic hair, though. Um, I or know are some, they? I think they are, you know. Mm -hmm. I think they are, and I certainly know male bodybuilders that have to get rid of all of their bodily hair, mm -hmm. you know, to compete, and, and do have the same insecurities and... Um, kind of have when you to conform, mm -hmm. you know, have to conform to a way of being to be mm -hmm. able to be considered um, just but just stage worthy or, mm -hmm. or whatever, you know. Kate. Um, yeah, so first of all, yeah, you're absolutely right, Francesca. There is an element of choice there, and, and mm -hmm. of course, the, this, there is lots of pressure on women to look a certain way, upstairs and downstairs, as it were, and, um, <laughs> and, and the solution to that isn't to then pressure women the other way. That does, we've got to remove the pressure and let everybody make free choices. That said, I also think, um, I, I was at the swimming baths uh, a, a few months ago, and, um, and I was having a shower, and some, some little girls came in, and they saw me in the shower, and they saw my pubes, and they screamed. <laughs> And I mean, that, and that, well, the thing is now, obviously their mums probably wax or vajazzle or whatever their thing is. And, and, and like, you know, like we've said, that's their choice, that's fine. But if, but if everybody does that, then the first thing that's gonna happen when these young girls hit puberty mm. is, is panic, is stress, is what's this? It's wrong, it's awful. So I think that, that for those of us who feel able to grow our pubes out and just, you know, be normal and whatever, that's fine. Um, and, that, and that's a really positive thing that we can do, actually, to be kind of comfortable with ourselves and be ourselves, you know, making a statement that it's okay to be normal and natural. But I do want to come back to this notion because I do think that there is a lot of pressure on women to feel that they have to look and act and behave a certain way for the benefit of men. 
Um, and I really want to address that, especially like kind of the young straight women in the room. Look, I've been, I've been campaigning on feminist issues for like 20 years. Uh, I haven't waxed or plucked anything for a very, very long time. I've been loud and angry and I've, I've shouted about stuff and I've gotten angry and I've dressed inappropriately and I've not worn makeup and I've not had my hair cut for years and years and years. And you know what? <laughs> over the years, I've been, I've been called every name under the sun. I've been threatened with this. I've been threatened with that. Uh, I've, been, I've had my job taken away from me. I've had work taken away from me. I've had all sorts of aspects of my life totally, totally messed up. But I tell you what, in that whole 20 years, I have never, ever had trouble getting laid. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there's a question at the back. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of pick up on something because I went to the lecture about uh, Generation Triple X yesterday, which was about pornography and children and how they're exposed to it these days. Um, and they had on the panel four teenagers, two girls and two boys. Um, and there was a question from the audience um, afterwards, like asking the teenagers, do you think your body image affects, is affected by watching porn? And do you feel pressure to look like these people? And astonishingly, the boys said no, no, not really thought about that at all. And the girls did. The girls clearly said, I feel like I have to look like a porn star to be liked by a boy. And um, I wonder, I asked the question, why is that? Because porn star, male porn stars look, have perfect bodies and are like performing um, sex and, and, and it could put a lot of pressure on boys but apparently it doesn't. So why are the girls still so affected by that and the boys are not? <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Hannah. Well, I would say that's brainwashing and it's brainwashing that's coming from our visual culture and my problem with our visual culture and adverts like American Apparel, etc., etc., is that they target very young age group, they know their consumer base is now very young and they're desperate, so they need to get them young. And uh, what they do is they, they work, by working from the language of um, porn and, and, and mixing it with, with fashion, they're kind of normalizing these ideas to girls and boys from a very early age. Um, and the message, this, these are really the messages they're getting loud and clear more, and parents I think find it very hard to protect them from it. Also on the other side you have boys, I think it's 100% of boys, uh, 13 year old boys have seen porn. So you have a brainwashing that happens really early on as to what it means to be male and what it means to be female. And girls have just been brainwashed for a lot longer but it is happening to boys. Boys are now taking steroids. They're, uh, they're now being objectified in the same way that girls have been in adverts for many years. So I think it's really, you know, when you say about um, that we all should have a choice, and I, I absolutely believe that as an adult woman, I would never point the finger at any other woman. And, you know, we all have a choice, live and let live. But I think it's unfair, it's how it's the, the young teenagers, as young as 12, that are being targeted by this. Mm -hmm. And are also living in a culture where we, we seem to automatically sexualize teenagers and then we worry and then we are surprised when we have such terrible events as Rotherham and Oxford. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have a responsibility to stop brainwashing them because their teenage brains are so malleable. And actually you're right, what's happened um, isn't that women have become less pressurized, it's that men have become more pressurized, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a question just at the back on the window. Hi, in the media I see constant criticism of Beyonce and Nicki Minaj for over-sexualizing themselves and their performances, but I, don't, um, I see it as a form of other women trying to police other women's bodies, mm. but why, why is it that they can't do what they want to do and perform um, acts in the way they want to be at, um, perform them and be as sexual as they want to be without other women calling them things like feminist light? And I'd like to know your opinion on that. I would like to respond to that too. <laughs> any, anyone got any views? No, no views, okay. <laughs> go, go, okay. go first. So again, black women's bodies exist for labor. And when black women dare to step outside of that and actually say, this is my body, I can do what I want, it becomes a problem for so many people. And when the standard of beauty is whiteness 
and then you've got people looking at black women and actually calling them beautiful and sexy, there are some people who are going to be terrified that they will lose their hold on being the standard of beauty. There is also envy and jealousy at what the freedom that these women have, because again, black women are not allowed to be free in this world. And so by Beyonce dancing and, and being married and having a child and being a multimillionaire and traveling the world and living her dreams, she is doing so as a free woman. Nicki Minaj choosing to write whatever lyrics she wants to do, she is doing this as she is choosing to be a free woman. And a free black woman in this world is a contradiction to many. So the resistance and the pushback against that and the fight is problematic. It's, it's, it's going to be extreme because they dare call themselves Feminists. But what about the, the flip of that, the argument that she, um, whose choice is she acting out? So we is, don't know, is, is, is right? it her choice or is it the white record company owners? Right, and we don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. It's like, who are we to try to figure out who has what choice and who is doing what? Mm -hmm. And why is it that we look at her as though she is not making these choices all for herself? I see Beyonce as a very well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. And she has worked very hard. She's one of the hardest working women on the globe. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot of it is choice, a lot of it is guidance or what have you. But we don't have the right. And the same for Nicki Minaj. And you know, does, I, does I mean, class like come it. into it as well? Of course class has to do with it. But I, I think that, <laughs> again, when, when you have feminism and it's aligned with whiteness, and then you've got Chicana feminism, native feminism, black feminism, trans feminism, things like that, you know, it, it becomes one of those things where people start to say, we own this, we claim this, mm -hmm. and it's not right for you to go out there and mm -hmm. be a free black woman, because even though we are feminists, our feminist movement has been perpetually racist for centuries. We're not comfortable with you deciding now to stand up and say that you too are a feminist. Go pick another mm -hmm. word, that womanist mm -hmm. thing or something. Mm -hmm. Go be that, because mm -hmm. that's kind of what the mm -hmm. response is. Layla. Yeah. <laughs> This, and, and by the way, this doesn't just happen amongst you know, um, big names. Like, it happens amongst women like yeah. ourselves yeah, who right. are feminists. I, so many times I got told I wasn't a feminist because I was wearing red lipstick mm -hmm. and high heels. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was actually the whole notion of feminism was actually having the freedom of choice and being equal to all, all genders being equal. But for me to be told, I'm from an African culture, and as African woman, I love my culture of dressing up. Listen, African people, you could be a funeral or a wedding, we have we look glam, and I love that part of me. That's just who I am, okay? I'm not apologizing for anybody. But we do need to really challenge this idea of, it's, it's similar to slut shaming, really, and that happens amongst women who consider themselves feminist. And I wrote a, I remember I wrote a blog about this a couple of months ago, and so many young women wrote to me saying, this is the problem why I can't call myself a feminist, because if I wear makeup or high heels, I get told by someone else, actually, you're not a feminist. So mm -hmm. the word feminism actually needs to be, I don't know, it needs to be reborn again and actually go back to the actual real, what it actually meant. And this idea of actually having criteria now to be a feminist, I really struggle with. So, so even, yeah. even bodily criteria. Absolutely. Um, Kate, briefly. Um, yeah, so I just, I think the idea that, that any individual woman has somehow let down the whole of feminism is so preposterous, um, it's just not true. But I constantly get asked whether Miley Cyrus has finally killed us off. And, um, and, and, the, and the answer is this, I don't, think that, I don't think that Miley Cyrus has got anything to do, it's not about uh, Miley. There are three and a half billion women in the world, and the fact that one of them is a pretty teenager who puts her bum in the air is, it, of course, one of them is, uh, is, is, is absolutely, uh, you know, out of her head and goes skydiving with her eyes closed. So what? Yeah, there's three and a half billion women. We do all sorts of things. This is about men, actually. This is about the fact that our culture and our media panders so desperately to straight white heterosexual men that they will scour the four corners of the earth for something that these men might find attractive and serve it up on their breakfast plate. I consider myself very fortunate if one bloke from Croydon attends to my sexual needs once a week. Um, <laughs> and yet here we are, if, as, as, a, as a straight white heterosexual man, they're running around going, what about this? Do you like this? And, and, and it's, it, it's that. It's that, the, it's that the media is picking up on, on a small number of women who fit the ideal they're looking for. And then the media often ignores women who are doing amazing work because they don't fit the story that they want to tell about how we all like to be, uh, you know, sexualized all of the time. So I'm afraid we have to, we have to close this session. But please say a big thank you to this panel. Yeah.